Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guests today are Jim Dalkin, the Director of Financial Management Assurance at the Government Accountability Office, Ilanko Subramaniam, GRC Leader at Optiv, David Walter, the Vice President of RSA Archer, and Jason Malmstrom, Assistant Inspector General in the Audit Division at the Justice Department. Gentlemen, good to have you all with us today. Uh, let's talk about defining the terms governance, risk, and compliance. It means one thing in a corporate setting, it means something a little different in the federal setting, even though some of the elements are the same, cybersecurity, physical risk, financial, operational, and so forth. So why don't we start with you, Jim, at the GAO, since as the uh, financial assurance guy, you kind of spend your life looking at GRC, even if you don't call it that all the time. We do, and I think you're gonna be hearing a lot about risk management in the next several years. And, and there's different angles you can take as it relates to risk management uh, on a very, basic level, uh, GAO puts out the, the Green Book, which are standards for internal control. And one of the aspects of Green Book is a requirement for risk assessment. And, and we can go into that in a little more detail. But there's also the, the larger risk issue, which is called ERM. And, and that's m more about the enterprise risk. Uh, that's more about strategic risk. And, and we're seeing, uh, I know OMB uh, had a document A123, and A123 they specifically referenced that the executive agencies had to follow the Green Book, but they also incorporated in A123 an aspect of ERM or considerations for ERM. And A123 underwent a pretty comprehensive revision uh, recently, correct? It did, and one of the fundamental differences is uh, the commercial world has a framework called COSO and that's what they use for internal control. The government world now has a framework and that's the Green Book and in the new A123 highlighted that, which it's gonna be a challenge for executive agencies to figure out what is the best approach to implement A123, what's the best approach for looking at risk and also internal controls. And the big, one of the big changes in A123 was that enterprise risk, so it, it sort of expanded it beyond purely dollars and cents in finance. They did, and they talked about risk profiles and developing risk profiles. But it's a challenge for, for agencies because traditionally, I think management's looked at risk as this is something amongst ourselves. And now they're going to have to discuss that, and, and so it's going to, to bring about some interesting discussions. Okay, let's hop over to uh, Jason from Justice Department, and that must be something you're talking about. I sort of see inspectors general as the agency version uh, on the executive branch uh, of GAO on the uh, congressional side. Right, um, yes, we see ourselves that way too. So of course, when there are any changes to A123, certainly we were very involved in that process, very interested in what they would become. Um, enterprise risk management was put at the forefront. It was a concerted effort to say, we're gonna put risk management into the mainstream control environment so that it's not just one element, so the controls aren't just one element, but that we're looking at how do we implement risk management within those controls to make, uh, to make that more synonymous. Um, some of the aspects, too, from the Department of Justice is we look at it that the Justice Department, for instance, is multifaceted, so many different operations, that to look at the enterprise risk management, as Jim was talking about, what does that mean? And I think A123 is requiring many things in 2017. So from an OIG perspective, we're very interested to see what the Department of Justice, what all of government is doing to comply with those requirements and their first assessment, who's going to be responsible for risk management, and then how does that filter down? It has to be throughout the government. It has to be from the line person doing the, you know, actually entering in data all the way up to the person that is setting the control and the governance structure for that entity. And again, you have that uh, a, a department which is made up of a couple of really big bureaus and agencies and a bunch right. of small ones, but yet there has to be a total look at this whole thing from some po at some point at, to at uh, Maine Justice. Yes, exactly. And I think Maine Justice obviously going through a lot of effort to try to figure that out. What is completely cross-cutting throughout all of, all of the department? IT being one of those, mm -hmm. but then you also have certain entities, say the FBI, the DEA, ATF, law enforcement entities, which obviously have a lot of similar functions, well, what can we look at at an enterprise level where we could better coordinate that, break down the silos, so that we can have a more efficient 
more effective government. Okay, and we're going to go into that, uh, some detail of the uh, IT risks, the people risks, some of the financial management and shared services risks in detail, and also operations and physical plant. But before we get to that, I want to ask Ilanco, what do your federal customers ask? What, what are their pain points these days? I, I first want to kind of give my definition of the Please, risk and yeah. compliance, right? So um, risk is uh, it's the right place to start. Um, you know, risk is uh, understanding uncertainty, and uh, in 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 organizations, even federal, uh, meeting those objectives that they've outlined, right? And compliance essentially is is uh, focused on um, adhering to policies and regulations and things like that, whether it may be very micro or macro level. Uh, and then, of course, the governance governance part is the um, you know the the key stakeholders who actually putting in practices, processes and practices to, to govern the entire operations of risk and compliance. Um, you know, what we are seeing uh, essentially is uh, uh, the, the age-old struggles that companies have, which is, uh, you know, should these be, uh, uh, you know, um, a, a very macro thing or, or what, what applies to, you know, all of the different agencies and how they are different. But I think the bottom line is trying to figure out uh, you know, where's that impact, right? And 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 how can a, 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 a you know a risk management practices really can and help you to make those informed decisions? So right? risk management then is knowing the uncertainties, but then putting them in some kind of a probability or priority order. Absolutely, right? absolutely. And risk management should not be always used as a, a negative thing because uh, it can highlight a lot of opportunities that uh, organization should uh, adopt. I guess it can also maybe help you understand where not to waste time and resources on something that might be a risk but a pretty small probability. Yeah, so the outcome of a risk management activity, as uh, uh, Jim indicated, uh, could also be used to prioritize uh, controls and, and, and compliance activities and, 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 and organizational investments. That's sure. an important point. It's not about all risk. It's triaging the most mm -hmm. important risk. Absolutely, yeah. So, okay. I mean, traditionally organizations, whether it's uh, public or private, has always used risk management to, to identify uh, the top five risks, so to speak, right? If you have a board of directors uh, or an audit committee that you'd get a report to, uh, you know, that's what you'd be reporting to, if, even if you have 35 risks that you've done your assessments on. All right, good, and we'll get into some of those possible mm -hmm. risks. David, RSA Archer has, a, again, a broad view, given all the federal customers and commercial yep. that you have. And later on, we'll talk about what some commercial best practices are, but what do you, what do you see as the GRC best practices in federal, and yeah. again, what are the customers seeking these days? Yeah, Tom, I, just to pick up on what Alonka said, you know, if you think about risk management and what we're talking about, risk is not new, risk management's not new. I think, so what's this GRC thing? coming out of the blue and, and why should we be focusing on that. I think if you think about it though, around risk management today is, uh, especially in the federal space, the amount of risk and the t risk types are ever growing and getting more complex as we change on a daily basis. And uh, you know, Jason had mentioned a few of these and thinking about cyber and all the other risks that we're gonna go into detail today, I think that's changing the risk landscape for organizations and the specialization that's now required within agencies to manage risk is increasing because the risks are increasing. And to be able to coordinate that in a more effective uh, fashion across agencies is becoming paramount. And so Jason had mentioned silos, right? And that's a big uh, concern for organizations as they move forward in commercial and private is there's a lot of expertise, a lot of specialization in looking at risks in different ways. How do we bring that together in a cons coordinated, consolidated fashion to look and be able to prioritize, as we talk about, across different types of risk, mm -hmm. right? And having one taxonomy and one language from which to speak about, I think is where GRC, governance, risk, and compliance, coming together to break down silos, put information in the right people's hands to make better decisions about risk as, as the organizations go forward. Okay, and Jason, I imagine in a multifaceted department, that's a dynamic process because mm -hmm say you're deploying, I don't know, prosecutorial uh, resources, the different types of trends and crime and so forth are always, that the agency is confronting are always changing over time. So you can't decide this is the way it is today, 
but it may not be that way six months or six years from now. Yes, correct. Um, you know, it's risk, risk assessments, as with the OIG, we're always looking at and assessing risk. And like others have said, how do we prioritize our limited resources to help the department address those high priority risks? Um, it has to be continuous, it has to be pervasive. I think we're getting at a little bit, we're circling around knowledge management. We have to understand what is the operation. And that, again, I'll reiterate what I said previously, is that that's not just at leadership. We, we have, everyone has staff on the ground. All government agencies have staff on the ground that understand the real problems. You need a culture where those people can speak their mind, they're heard, it's considered, and then risk is either closed, accepted, or implemented based on what those people are saying as well as what the leadership wants and expects in its governance. All right, let's focus a little bit on risk, and I want to start with IT, uh, information technology, for a couple of reasons. One, it can have severe operational impacts. Uh, two, it can have financial impacts when projects don't go as they should. And we've seen in the commercial sector just recently, not one but two major airlines because of aging IT infrastructure, so far as we can tell, suffered outages pretty severe. In one case, you know, th there's real financial risk from that, reputational and operational and so forth. So let's talk about um, two sides of IT in, in the federal uh, that are risky. One is the risk of not modernizing, which agencies are talking more and more about, and there's all kinds of risks on that side. Then there's also risks in modernizing, because you're going to something new and, uh, and perhaps untested in the long term. So everywhere, everywhere you look, there are risks. Uh, Jim, you know, GAO oversees that a lot. What do you, what do you see as the major risks and, and uh, how to prioritize those? I think in the government as a whole, there's great variability. You have some systems that are old mainframe systems, hopefully not card systems, mm -hmm. but uh, all the way to you some of the modern punch systems. You can still cards on the GAO <laughs> schedule, though, the GSA schedule. <laughs> But the challenge is, it's, it's whether you have an old system or a new system, the whole, uh, the, the ability to penetrate a system to be able to, uh, for an outside party to get in has become m much more of a discussion point in, in recent years. And it does potentially have an impact, uh, potentially on, even on financials. So it, it's something that the auditors have to assess as well. And Justice, too, has some systems that go way back. If they work, way but back. yeah. Uh, no, legacy systems are an issue. Uh, everyone is looking to how do we improve those systems. Uh, I think a big decision is do we build a completely new system? Do we try to update the legacy system? Those are difficult questions to ask many times just based on the needs and the operations of that department or the component. Um, I'll give one example. The FBI uh, somewhat recently, uh, a few years back, finally implemented their Sentinel case management system. Right? It's a new age, contemporary case management system. It took a long time for them to get there. It goes back about three and a half administrations. <laughs> yes, it does, yes. <laughs> We've been there all along the way. The FBI very happy to have us alongside um, reviewing them. To their credit, they started the process where, with a very, I want to say, somewhat outdated approach, um, as government sees it now, in saying, here are all our requirements, hire a contractor, and then they develop all those requirements for delivery. It just was not happening, so they went to an iterative, agile approach. And I think you're seeing a lot more of that in government. They recognize that's a huge risk. Risks are always evolving. Mm -hmm. And so if you have a system that takes multiple years to implement, you don't know at the time you initially put it in, this could be a, a future threat. Yeah, and I'm going to ask David and Elanco to talk about the uh, fact that cybersecurity figures into both not modernizing and modernizing in interesting and complex ways technically. but ultimately in terms of risk and operation. David, you wanna I think it, go it, first yeah, on Yeah, absolutely, Tom. I think it's interesting as we talk about things like Sentinel and everything, is how do we take advantage of the opportunity of using technology as enabling our agencies to progress their missions. Um, with that, that brings risk, right, of course. And things like IoT and, and Internet of Things and mobile and all these in cloud and FedRAMP, all these activities allow us to do more things for our our, our citizens, which is good, but they also bring in new threats and new risks and something we have to manage. And I think the, in the risk management space, the concern is that those activities were traditionally managed more by IT personnel. And that's great because they have the expertise in those areas. But now when you're looking at risk from an enterprise risk perspective or at maybe a green book level, right, we need to translate those those cyber and very technical risks to more like impact and likelihood and, and risk speak. And so, and we see it at RSA, a big gap occurring there 
between IT professionals and more business risk professionals and, and auditors, how do we make that translation uh, in terms of the taxonomy and how we talk about risk to better define uh, and bring this cyber risk and these new threats and actors, how do we put that in more speak that we can all understand and, and prioritize better? Okay, and Alonco, how do we do that? Yeah, so I, I think um, you still need to kind of go back and look at the, the fundamental building block of uh, risk management, right, which is uh, threats and vulnerabilities, right? So in the cyber area, the threats are much more evolving and it's an arms race, right? So as you start to build uh, your controls and your your uh, protective uh, measures, uh, the threats already progressed mm -hmm. tremendously, right? So, so in order to deal with uh, you know um, uh, traditional legacy systems and 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 modernized systems, you know where should we make those investments? I think it's uh, it's putting together a business case, right? You know, looking at uh, risk reward. Uh, you know, activities and, and putting together that business case and using risk as a critical component to make those decisions, to inform decisions, right? Um, so I, I think uh, you have to take it case by case, right, to figure out if that reinvestment is needed uh, and if those uh, systems have those vulnerabilities that can be exploited, right? And, um, and what is the reward? Right? So, so I think the decision should be made based on those. It's a good place to stop right now. We've got a lot of ground to cover. Right now we're going to take a short break. My guests today are Jason Malmstrom, Assistant Inspector General in the Audit Division at the Justice Department. Jim Dalkin is Director of Financial Management Assurance at the Government Accountability Office. Ilanko Subramaniam is the GRC Practice Leader at Optiv. And David Walter, Vice President of RSA Archer. I'm your moderator, Tom Temin. Our discussion is In Focus, Governance, Risk, and Compliance, sponsored by RSA and Optiv, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. <laughs> 